Welcome to Truth in History. God's true people, Israel. Revelation of God's plan. Fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Mystery of God shall be finished. Kingdoms become kingdoms of Christ. Truth in History with Charles A. Jennings. The psalmist said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Welcome to Truth in History. Today I would like to talk about a subject that I have entitled, Enemies of the Church, or Enemies Within the Gate. Now the church has always had enemies, outward enemies, beginning in the first century. When you read the book of Acts, you see how the Sanhedrin, the Jewish hierarchy, persecuted the church. You see how Saul of Tarsus was sent from Jerusalem by the the council to hail men and women into prison, possibly even put them to death. And then the Roman Empire, the persecutions that took place were brutal. And we all know about Nero, the man who hated Christians and hated Christianity. And then the Caesars. And then coming down through history, we have folks, the Roman Catholic Church, that murdered over 60 million Christians. They weren't called Protestants at the time, but they were protesting what the church taught. They would not give allegiance to the Pope or to the councils. And look at the persecution that came during the Protestant Reformation. That all those persecutions and enemies came from the outside. What about enemies within the gate? What about enemies inside the church? Now we're all familiar with Revelation chapter 3. Well, actually 2 and 3 where Jesus condemns the seven churches of Asia. But in chapter 3 we read about the words of the Lord Jesus Himself to the church of Laodicea. And Revelation 3 verse 14 says, And the angel unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, and this is the reason, he says, you're not cold, you're not hot, you're lukewarm. And it's because you're making this declaration. The church at Laodicea made this declaration in verse 17, I am rich. I am increased with goods. I have need of nothing. And you know not that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Now, do you think that that verse, number 17, and that description fits our modern day church at large, I would have to say that it does. And there were people, now this was the first century church, and there were people 
that Paul was writing about that, ex that lived in the first century, and he was describing in, in 1 Timothy chapter 6. He says, there were those in the church that were proud. This is 1 Timothy 6, beginning with verse 4. He said, there were those that were proud, knowing nothing, doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof comes envy, strife, railings, and evil surmisings, also perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, destitute of truth, and then he describes an element within that first century church that supposed that gain was godliness. They believed that gain, material gain, was true spirituality. Paul said, from such withdraw thyself. Now, in Revelation chapter 3, going back to our text, I would like to point out that I believe that the, in, the worst enemies that the, the body of Christ has today, or the worst enemies that the church at large, the institutionalized, organized, sanitized, pasteurized church has today. Number one is materialism. Jesus said in describing this church, He said, because you proclaim that you are rich and increased with goods. I believe the second enemy is ignorance. He says, you know not that you are wretched. You're so dumb that you do not know your wretched state that you are in. Number three is uncleanness. Uncleanness. He says, what you need, in verse 18, is to buy of me gold tried in the fire. And that's the true riches and white raiment that thou may be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that you may see. Now, uncleanness. The words of sanctification and holiness are no longer heard in churches anymore, or they're very, very rare that you hear those words, sanctification or holiness, clean living, separation from the world and worldly entertainment and worldly mentality. Now, uncleanness, filthiness, of mind and body and action. We have come to the place where it is now necessary to Christianize Christians. They no longer have a Christian mentality. Even in the, quote, holiness churches, you don't hear the word holiness anymore. In fact, I have heard some people on TV, some religious celebrities make fun of the old-fashioned holiness people. I was shocked. I was shocked. 
The fourth enemy is rebellion. Rebellion. People want to do what they want to do. They do not want, generally speaking, to submit themselves to godly authority and submit themselves to Christ and die. They want to improve on the old man. I was telling a man the other night that there's a difference between being crucified with Christ and letting this old man die than improving on this old man. And there was a group of people several years ago, whether they exist today or not, it was a society or a club called the Moralist, and they judged one another. If, if some of them did wrong, the others would judge. You, should, you shouldn't be uh, angry in traffic. You shouldn't get angry at your children. You shouldn't curse. You shouldn't steal. You, you should be kind to your family. You should be a, a good man. Don't drink. Don't smoke. Uh, don't carouse around. Don't be unfaithful. Well, the, all those are good things, but they were just improving on the old man instead of dying. As Paul said, he said, I live by the faith of the Son of God because he said, I have died and I submit myself to the living Christ. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live in Christ. There's a difference. You know, I have asked myself the question several times. Let me, let me just give you a little enlightenment in some of my history. I was raised, I was born and raised in a Christian home, in a Pentecostal home in a home that taught and practiced holiness of living. Now, some of you might say, well, you know, that's kind of a strange thing to me. I was raised in church X, Y, or Z. I wasn't around those weirdo, strange, Pentecostal, tongue-talking, holiness people. Well, we weren't as strange as some people thought we were. but. I was raised in a home where the Bible was revered was, and Christ was at the priority of our life and our, our entertainment. And our whole, our whole life was church and worship and living right every day. And I was in what you might call the traditional, classical, Pentecostal church. And Church of God, headquarters Cleveland, Tennessee, Assemblies of God, later on Assemblies of God, I'm in neither one today. Um, but I have often wondered, after this new wave of Pentecostalism came along, this modern wave of Pentecostalism that came in the 70s and 80s and has now come into this century, I have often wondered how Christian are we? Really, how Christian are we? You know, the Protestant church has criticized the Roman church for all of its relics. Uh, on the west coast of California, some of those missions you can go in and in a box with a glass sides, you can look in there and see the bones of saints. And they have, you know, apparitions and they have images and they have crosses and they have pictures and the 14 stations of the cross and all those things. We criticize those people, but yet more modern Pentecostalism has come up 
with its own images, with its own fetishes. And what is a fetish? Anything held in unreasonable devotion, a charm. It actually turns out to be sorcery. And I want to give you some of the things that has irked me through my life. Growing up in the tradi traditional Pentecostal church, and then as that waned, and seeing this new wave of Pentecostalism, we come to what I call the Judas Syndrome. The Judas Syndrome, remember when the, the, when the woman anointed the feet of Jesus with that expensive ointment, Judas was angry. He said, well, we could have sold that and given it to the poor. So uh, we come up with the Judas Syndrome, and the Judas Syndrome is this, to turn the anointing into cash under the pretense of helping the poor. That spirit has pervaded modern Pentecostalism today, and maybe even beyond the bounds of Pentecostalism. So therefore, in their collection of money, one of the fetishes is, the Lord told me, the Lord told me, as someone taking up the offering or pleading for money, most likely the Lord never told him anything. Number two is, I feel the anointing that you should give a certain amount of money. I feel the anointing in the studio. Folks, personally myself, I seriously doubt it. They may have a sensation. They may have a feeling, but it's not necessarily the anointing. And they say that to put a sanction upon what they are doing, trying to collect money. Number three, the phrase that is often used is, this is your season. In other words, you better give your money now, otherwise you won't have the blessing because your season is going to run out. Number four, I am going to release a blessing. The preacher is going to release a blessing. Jesus is the blesser. But they're, what they're implying is that if you give to their ministry, as he's taken up that offering and pleading for money, that he will release a blessing to you. Folks, I get more out of watching The Lone Ranger and Tonto than some of these religious programs on television whose idea of that gain is godliness. Number five, in a season like a Passover season, a Pentecost season, or a tabernacle season, give your Pentecost offering. Give your Passover offering because this time span is going to run out in a week or whatever. Number six, the Lord gives the preacher, he claims, the Lord gives him a certain amount for you to give. So the preacher says, I'm collecting this, this money for my ministry, and the Lord told me that you're going to give, that you should give $500 or $599 or some amount. I seriously doubt it, folks. Number seven, a stock market promise of return. The Lord's going to return this unto you tenfold or fivefold or whatever it may be. A stock market type mentality. Number eight, they choose a magical date like 
several years ago. It was July the 7th of 07. That was a special day. You had to give on that day $777 or $77.70. Nothing. It's nothing more than marketing shrouded in religious terms. Another one, number nine, collecting money for the Jews. If you give to the Jews in this offering, God will bless you. That's what they say. Because you're blessing God's people. Well, first of all, they're not God's chosen people. Second of all, we are told that if you bless the enemies of the Lord, there's a curse upon you. Second Chronicles 19, verses 1 and 2. Or, write for this holy water, and you will reap money. Several years ago, an evangelist out of Arizona sent to my house, and I'm sure thousands of other homes, a letter and a little plastic package of cornmeal and said, put this in your cupboard and your cupboard will never run dry. It'll never be empty. Of course it wouldn't be empty. It'd have that little cornmeal bag up there. I didn't fall for it, but he wanted the recipients of this cornmeal to send in money. Paul said that there would come in our day, just like in first century, those that believe that gain is godliness. Holy water out of some holy well somewhere. Or you will receive a special blessing if you come with me and you're baptized in the River Jordan. You could go down to your local creek and be baptized, and it would fulfill righteousness in your life just as much as going to the River Jordan in Palestine. It's nothing but sentimentalism, folks. It's sentimentalism. Or praying in Jesus' tomb. I wonder how much they charge you. To go in there, lay down, and you can come out and say, I prayed in the tomb where Jesus laid. It's a tourist trap. Basically, it's a spiritual speed trap, just like some of these small towns you drive through. It's a speed trap shrouded in religiosity or praying at the wailing wall. Now we're seeing Protestants, Christians, non-Jews sticking their little piece of paper with their prayer on it in the cracks of the wailing wall. Folks, that's fetishism. All these things that I mentioned is nothing but spiritual fetishes. What we need in our day is the purity of the gospel. We need no empire building where men have homes in Palm Beach and one in Palm Springs and a ranch in South Texas and, a, and some other big piece of property in California or something. And I heard one man on television, he was describing his home and how he had electric gates and a driveway that was a quarter of a mile long and living in an old, uh, in a modern mansion with, with the old southern columns out front that used to be back in antebellum days. And how he had swimming pools and 
he had this huge, palatial house to live in. What's his point? And then he said, the man of God deserves it. Well, I'm looking in history, and I'm seeing where some men, some real men of God, look at the apostles. Every one of them gave their life for Jesus Christ. They had nothing. They had absolutely nothing in the way of material wealth. Even in the early days in this country, men that sacrificed their lives riding a horse, you know, all across the South, preaching the gospel, just staying, living under trees or in somebody's barn. Uh, in the early days of the Baptist movement and the Pentecostal movement in this country, men, they did without. They did without food for days as they traveled from camp meeting to camp meeting. They had no earthly gain. And then we have this modern mentality that the man of God deserves the best. He deserves a Cadillac and a Mercedes Benz, and his wife deserves one too, and all of his children. Folks, Revelation chapter 3, verse 17 describes the modern Pentecostalism movement. And I don't know about the other denominations, but it does. And I know that this is not very popular in what I'm saying. And I'm not trying to win friends or influence people. I want to speak my convictions without fear or favor. If people cut me off, don't send me another nickel. That's fine with me. But I want to be honest before God and men that we must have and preach a purity of gospel and quit building material, earthly empires on this earth because it's fading. We live, we're living in a dying civilization. We're living in a dying nation, in a corrupt society, and preachers, many of them, amassing unto themselves money and riches and prestige and thousand-dollar suits. Brother, all that's going to go up in smoke one of these days. Jesus is coming, and we're going to have to give an account for our preaching and everything that we have done to the body of Christ in corrupting the true gospel. God give us men of God and our nation once again. For any material offered on this program or to be a part of this ministry, please write or call today. We thank you and may God bless you for your response to this end time ministry. Truth in history, where the word of God is not bound.